Hello. You thought you got to escape me because I'm not here. But lucky you. I love you enough that I made a video of me so that I will be available for you even if I'm not here. And you will be pleased to know I don't have popcorn this time. Um, I do have my drink because you know I can't teach without this. And today I brought chocolate. So I'll be eating chocolate instead of popcorn. There's a reason that I continue to gain weight. It's because of you. Because I'm teaching you and therefore I have to have food. So, can't be here, but I do need to make certain you are prepared for the upcoming walkaway. Now, a reminder that we have a walkaway on October 12th and 14th. That's next Monday and Wednesday. The walkaway is open book, so be certain that you bring your completed workbook, and you will have most of the information on Native Americans completed by the end of today. Make sure you bring that, because if you've kept good notes, you can have access to uh, to them during the lecture, and that will be a tremendous help. Um, so again, next Wednesday, and, no, excuse me, Monday and Wednesday will be the walkaway. So today, we're going to prepare you for that walkaway by covering the last three native groups that we have not covered. I realize one of your classes has not yet done the California. I'll do that with you when I get back. But the rest of you have covered, um, at this point, Eastern Woodland, Plains, and California. And with each of those groups, I've showed you how they lived, where they lived, uh, examples of clothing, diet, climate, and the culture. So to, I'm going to do that same thing with our last three native groups. So we have a lot to cover today. We'll be doing Northwest, Inuit, and Southwest. So you'll be taking quite a few notes. Today in class, you will be finishing the notes on... I'm going to go ahead and open this up in my workbook, and you should be doing the same thing while I'm opening it up. In the blue workbook, you are on pages 16, uh, starting on page 16 on the very bottom, Native American, Northwest Coastal. That's in the blue book. In the yellow book, same area, but the page numbers are different, and that's page... 39 Northwest Coastal. Now you have a teacher here with you today. Um, teacher, would you please take a second to make sure they've all opened up their workbook to these pages? You can go ahead and pause this. And then, you know, before she does that, just a quick reminder. Um, the teacher who's come in to meet with you today is doing so as a favor to me. I really appreciate that. But I believe uh, it is the spouse of one of our counselors. So please treat them with respect. If there are any problems or if you misbehave, I have spoken with Ms. Mr. Flood across the hall, and he's indicated I should send you, um, or the, the substitute should send you over to Mr. Flood's room where he would be happy to put you into the corner of the room where you can write the Constitution. Now, the Constitution is a fascinating document, but I don't think you want to do that. So please treat our substitute with respect because you have a lot to do today. Okay, if you have your book open and ready, let's go ahead and get started, and we're going to do Northwest Coastal. Okay, so the, the big broad understanding that I'm hoping you gain in the course of this month-long unit on Native Studies is that Native Americans were and are a diverse and unique. They have and are contributing a great deal to American culture. Today we're going to focus on that first essential question, in what ways were pre-Columbian Native American cultures distinct and similar. In the past we focused on plains and eastern woodland in California. Today we're going to focus on the Northwest Natives, the Inuit, and Southwest Natives. So if you're ready begin, to begin, please keep your book open on page 16 in the blue book and in the, the yellow book, page 39, and we'll go ahead and get started. Remember, you're filling in the blanks with the words that are underlined. Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest lived on a narrow coastal area stretching from Alaska to northern Washington. If you look on the map, it highlights the area in orange as the area that is northern coastal. In truth, most historians would, would extend that a little bit to the right or to the east, and I'll show you a map in a moment that makes that a little clearer. This area stretched from Alaska in the south, the southern portion of Alaska, to northern Washington, and just a tip of, of Oregon. It is highlighted by extensive mountain ranges, specifically we're talking about the Cascade Range here, and the coastal mountains that isolated them from the rest of the country. It allowed them to live without a lot of contact with other native peoples. At a wide variety of climates. Generally, it's considered an oceanic climate, and here's your second word you're filling in, a moderate climate. 
It was dominated by the ocean on the west, the Pacific Ocean, and the Cascades and coastal ranges on the east, the high mountain ranges. And the natives lived generally to the east of those mountain ranges. So the picture you see on your screen better indicates or shows where they would live. So I know you need to write down the words, but I want to focus for a moment on that picture. If you look at the, so look in the upper left-hand corner, you see the white ranges. Those are actually the Cascades and Coastal Ranges covered by snow. So the white is the snow. I want you to look to the left of those snowy mountain ranges and you'll see a dark green patch, this picture from space. That is the coastal uh, area where the Northwest, Northwest Coastal Natives lived. The dark green, this is very green, verdant, rich part of the Americas. And most of them lived there. Now, you remember that I indicated that, in fact, most historians have broadened the range of the Northwest Coastal. It appears that Northwest Coastal peoples traveled quite often over the Cascade Range and moved uh, so that they were west, or excuse me, east of the Rockies, but west of the Cascades, so that they lived in an area um, from mm, northern Oregon, Washington, and into uh, if you know where British Columbia and Vancouver are at, was really the range of the Northwest Coastal Natives. So now that you have the geography down, let's look at their life a little bit. So back in your book again, filling in the blanks, Northwest Native Americans were generally peaceful. They had so much abundance that warfare wasn't necessary. necessary. There was raiding that occurred between villages, and that was quite common, but generally considered peaceful. It was not, you know, killing was not a part of that raiding. The economy was based on the abundant natural resources it had. So it had access to a lot of stuff. They would be considered wealthy by their terms and certainly by our terms as well. Specifically, the uh, natural resources that were key to Northwest Coastal were the fish on the Pacific and, of course, in the Columbia River uh, Basin that they pulled out of the Columbia River, and wood. And with wood, we specifically are talking about cedar. In some ways, uh, the salmon and the cedar replaced... So in the Plains culture, we talked about how the buffalo gave them food, clothing, shelter. In the case of the Northwest Coastal, it will be salmon and, and uh, cedar that give them food, clothing, and shelter. Their diet consisted of some red meat. There was a lot of deer that's abundant in the Northwest Coastal region, as well as elk. Um, fish, lots of fish. They were on major riverways and on the Pacific Ocean. Dried fruit, in fact, some of you have had the opportunity to travel to Seattle or Vancouver, and you've seen the abundance of dried berries, the huckleberries and blackberries and uh, raspberries that grow still today all over the Northwest culture. Those berries that grew in the spring and summer were dried and became part of their diet, like raisins would be today uh, in the Northwest coastal during the winter um, season. Of course, they have a long growing season in this area, so you know that stuff was there until November. Because they had so much food, they had so many building materials, this area prospered. And so individuals would show off their wealth and their social standing by holding events called potlatches. I'm going to come back to this page, but let me show you a picture of a potlatch on this next page. So I know you have to write in those words, but let me explain what's happening here. In the center of the potlatch, it's a party, you'll see a man, this would be the family, the family head or the clan leader, who has in front of him a pile of blankets. It's a party, and at this party, they're going to tell stories. They'll share food. They'll tell, tell stories. The stories will focus around those totem poles you see in the back. And to show their wealth and to achieve social standing in their culture, when the party ends, he will give gifts to his guests. Now, the best parallel to a potlatch to me is a birthday party or a wedding in our culture today. You know, people laugh when you say, oh, the host gave gift? That seems kind of pointless. I mean, why would you have a party if you have to give things away? But people do that all the time, even today. Think how many times you've had birthday parties where you have gift bags for the guests who come. Or wedding receptions. I remember when my daughter got married, we told her we could, she could either have a large wedding reception or we would give her money toward college or toward a home. My children chose to have a wedding reception. They said, well, we'll get gifts. But the truth is the cost of that wedding reception. Guests came. We had to feed them. We had to buy them food. Uh, for the, the, the bridesmaids, we'd buy them expensive dresses. 
it was a way of showing off our love for our daughter and her status. So we spent a lot more money on that wedding reception than she actually made in gifts. That's kind of like a potlatch. So people would come to these potlatches and the host would give away their belongings in order to gain respect. Now I indicated in that picture you saw in the background images of totems. A totem con didn't contain, it was a, a symbol of an ancestor or an animal spirit that would be carved into the totem pole and the stories of those totems were told at the potlatches. Again, there's our picture of our potlatch and in the background you see the totems. I'm going to come back to totems in a moment, but before we do that, let me give you a little information about their homes and their clothing. In this group are uh, the Alaskan, the Tlingit, the Tshimshian, the Coeur d'Alene, the Luchhi, the Maka, and the Nez Perce. That's only a few. Remember that there's, in each group, we're talking probably, and I'm, I'm guesstimating here based on my knowledge, but we're looking at least 75 different tribal groups in the Northwest culture. And of course we see a lot of variety between those different tribes. They may have different languages and, you know, uh, they're the same family of languages, but different languages, different religious traditions, etc. Now on the, on the screen you see two examples of their homes. On the left is a cedar home, and we're actually going to see them cut uh, shingles for one of those homes in just a moment. The majority of Northwest cultures lived in, well they were permanent, they were not nomadic. And their primary wood for building their homes was cedar. This home is decorated, as were most of their homes, by totems. But those totems have also extended onto the home themselves. Those, those symbolic representations of spirits or of family members who've gone before. And then on the right is a picture or a drawing of a longhouse. Uh, this would also be made with uh, cedar shingles. Longhouses could be very large. And in fact, on the picture before, uh, there is a, a cedar longhouse behind the elder who is speaking. Notice these homes are fairly similar in structure to European homes. They're boxier. Most of the homes we've looked at have been more dome-shaped. These homes are boxier. Um, so when the Europeans first came here, they recognized these homes. They were homes that they had, had seen, similar homes, in Europe. Now before I go to the totems, I want to talk about their clothing. The people of the Northwest Coastal Area um, frankly wore very little clothing. It was a nice climate. They had different um, senses of morality, understandings of nudity, and it wasn't, uncom it wasn't uncommon at all for people to, you know, put on a loincloth and run around in the, in the warmer months. Men would often go naked. You know, they typically cover their genitalia, but everywhere else they were naked, and same for women. They would wear a bark skirt, and other than that, they didn't see any need to wear more clothing. It was kind of like Polynesian culture they covered their genitalia and then the rest they just left bare because they saw no point in covering themselves. They, they were hot, so why cover themselves? <laughs> uh, clothing was made out of a number of different things. Um, one of their common clothing was weaving cedar wood fiber. Now I know that sounds really um, coarse, but if you look below on the left hand side, you'll see a cedar wool blanket. This is from the Chilkat natives. And on the top, you see beadwork on the cedar cloth. But if you look below, it looks rather soft. And cedar cloth is very soft. It's hammered out. It's a very soft fiber by the time it's, it's been worked. And it's also a strong fiber. Uh, they also used animal leather. And post-Columbian, uh, the Northwest culture used wool. You have two examples of clothing on the screen. The Chilkat blanket with the cedar cloth. And on the right, you see Chilkat dancers that are dressed largely in cedar cloth. Um, this picture taken in 1895, so there may be some wool that's used there as well. So that's Northwest clothing, Northwest housing, and Northwest culture. I wanted to come back to the totem pole. So a totem pole was um, a carved image of an ancestor or an animal spirit, typically on a large cedar pole. The stories of each of those spirits or ancestors would be told in a potlatch. Well, let me tell you a little bit about how they would create a totem. A totem is a sacred being, and it's a sacred object as well. So you, you won't see a lot of totem poles um, anymore. I mean, you'll see, you know, capitalists, like people making money off totem poles. But the original to totem poles, most of those are gone because they were considered sacred. Um, 
And you could have a totem that represented a tribe. So you might have a totem of a raven that represented the raven tribe. Be more common, however, to see a totem representing a clan, the raven clan. And within that clan, you might have a family that had a separate totem, so the caribou uh, totem. And then each individual would have their own totem. The Northwest tradition of Native peoples provided that every individual is connected to one of nine different animals. And then that animal spirit accompanies that individual throughout their life. It can act as a guide. You'll have a, one animal that is your core you, but you may have other animals or totals that, totems that come in and out of your life depending on you know, the direction that you're moving or you're headed or the tasks that you need to complete along your life journey. Disney made a movie sometime back called uh, Brother Bear. You might be familiar with it. Brother Bear plays on that idea of totems. And you might remember the very beginning of that film, there's a scene where the young man goes before the tribal council and he's going to the elder, um, the shaman, in, this, in the movie it's a woman, who is telling him what his totem is. Native American belief explains that a totem animal is one that is with you for life. Other ones may come in and out, but you have your core totem animal that represents you. It's both with you in the physical world, in the present, and also in the spiritual world, which Northwest Coastal would say that spiritual and physical world exist side by side. With this one animal, you share a connection, and it might be in interests or in characteristics, dreams, or other interactions. So let me give you an example. One of the most common totems in Northwest uh, culture is the bear. The behaviors of the bear, or the, in Northwest culture, they'd say that the bear totem is industrious. It's healing. It has power. It's a kind of a guardian of the world. It's a watcher. It has courage um, and great strength. A person who felt like the bear was their totem would connect to those ideas. Another, uh, another totem that's used a lot in Native culture is that of the beaver, which cons is considered determined. It's an overseer and a protector. It takes care of others. So if you saw yourself in that light, you may connect with the beaver as your totem. Um, another one that was common in Northwest culture, remember there are nine primary ones, would be the crow. And you'll actually see on this one, they have the crow or the raven at the very top of the totem pole on the right. And the symbols, the, the ideas, the concepts, the characteristics of this uh, totem um, are justice. It changes. It's creative. It has great spiritual strength, energy, uh, balance, and it's considered a shapeshifter. So the person knowing their totem animal, sometimes it's innate. Like they, they know from birth that is who I am. And in other cases, it's something that they would learn from the shaman in a religious ceremony. So exactly how does the totem pole encompass that? The belief is that once you've received your totem, your symbol, um, you might put that on, for example, if we look at, back at this picture right here. I had a picture of a home. I can find that here. There we are. Picture in the bottom left-hand corner. Those totems may represent those people who live in that home. However, you'll notice that, like, look at the central uh, totem pole. There's actually multiple symbols. Because the idea was when a person passes from this life, your grandmother passes away, you can capture somewhat of the essence of your grandmother through her totem by carving that image into a totem pole. So this image you see on the right may actually show three or four different generations. It's kind of like Shintoism, if you're familiar with that in Japanese culture, where you can capture the essence of a being in an in a image, in this case the totem, and then when that being has passed beyond this life, you can get wisdom from them by communing at the totem pole. So that's the totem pole. I think they're absolutely fascinating, and you'll largely see those in Northwest culture. So before we move on and we leave Northwest Coastal, um, I want to talk a little bit. I want to actually um, share with you a film clip on Northwest Coastal. And when we're finished with this, I'm going to have you in your workbooks on page, let's see if I can find this for you, 
Yellow Books, page 40. Blue Books, page 17. I want you to go back and look through your notes after you've watched this film clip I'm going to share with you. So these notes we just took right here, we talked about where they lived, what their climate was like, what their diet was like. We talked about potlatches and totem poles. Uh, we talked about the homes they lived in, how they used cedar bark and leather and did beadwork. So we talked about their clothing. Um, what I would like you to do when you're finished here, after the film clip I'm going to show, is share one interesting fact you learned about the Northwest Coastal Natives and why. So let's pause here and I'm going to share with you a film clip on this culture. Along the northwest coast of the United States and into Canada is a land of great beauty where ocean, forest, and rock live together in harmony. Remote and isolated, all that is usually heard are the sounds of the natural world, the waves, wind, seabirds. But if you listen carefully, you can sometimes hear a song an ancient song of the people who call this land their home. The people of the Northwest Coast. The people of the Northwest Coast have many names. Nootka. Salish. Quakutl. Quilcene. Simshian. And many others. Each have different names, each speak different languages, but they all share a common background. They were and still are a great fishing people, fishing the many rivers and streams that cut through this land. They built great cedar canoes and traveled the ocean and rivers in search of game. They hunted sea mammals, even whales. From the great cedar trees that grow here, they built impressive wooden homes, decorating them with ornate carvings and paintings. They carved totem poles. The symbols represent animals and spirits. They wore clothing woven from the bark of trees, as well as animal hides. While the people didn't have a a written language, they did have rich oral traditions and passed down their legends during ceremonies. They carved wooden masks which often represented supernatural beings important to the history of the people. Ornately carved figures were common in many wooden items. This is a bowl. They also carved stone. This is a small chest. A bowl. From cedar bark, they wove beautiful baskets. They designed ingenious fishing hooks. These have wooden shanks and the barb is carved from bone. Spear and harpoon points were carved from stone, bone and sometimes ivory. A variety of tools were used to work the cedar forests. The coast people were among the first Native Americans to use iron in their tools. The source of the metal may have been in Siberia, reaching the northwest coast through trade. But even after they obtained metal, they continued to use stone for some tools. The people felt closely related to all things in the natural world. They felt that everything in the natural world had a spiritual life, and that everything was connected to everything else in a spiritual way. Who are the coast people? How did they get here? Where did they come from? While all tribes have their own origin stories, most anthropologists accept the following. About 30,000 years ago, North America looked much as it does today. 
A narrow stretch of ocean separated Asia from this continent. There were no people living here. Then, ice began to advance across the northern hemisphere. As it did, sea levels dropped, exposing a land bridge connecting Asia with North America. Large game animals like bison and mammoth crossed this land bridge, entering the new continent, soon followed by Asian hunters. There were probably several migrations over thousands of years, and eventually the people spread throughout North and South America, as the ice retreated and the land bridge became covered by water again. There were hundreds of tribes, but each can be classified into one of several groups, according to the natural environment in which they lived. The names of these groups are the Eastern Woodlands, the Plains, the Southwest, the Great Basin, the Plateau, California, and the Northwest Coast. Each of these groups lived in an environment that was unlike the others. None of the others lived in an environment quite like this one, the Northwest Coast, the land of the coast people. This region consists of dense forests and rugged coastlines. The climate is mild, a lot of rain and little snow. The people who inhabited the coastline became expert at ocean fishing and the hunting of sea mammals, while those who lived inland hunted forest animals and fished the fjords and rivers. What would it have been like to have lived back then? To have lived like the coast people hundreds of years ago? This is the dance of the bear. But it is more than a dance, for it tells a story. A story about our courageous ancestors. The most important part of the dance is when the bear threatens our chief. The chief must ignore the threats, proving to everyone that he is very brave. Bravery is important to our people. Funny, it was never that important to me, until recently. My name is Dashutahi. It means Golden Sparrow. I have lived for 15 winters here with my people, the Gitsan, in the house of the Frog Clan. So why is bravery important to me now? To explain that, I have to tell you a little about our people. We live in a small village along the Shun River in five cedar houses. This is our food storage house. It's built on stilts to help keep it dry during heavy rains and snow. And this is our smokehouse, where we smoke fish to preserve them during the long winters. In front of each house is a pole with many carved figures. One of the figures is very special, like this one, the wolf. This tells everyone that this house belongs to the wolf clan. My clan is the frog, and that's why there's a frog carved in the top beam of our house. Clans share the same houses together. There might be as many as four to five families living in a single house. So it's a good thing our houses are so big. And even here we've carved special figures important to our clan and its history. Our houses are made from cedar logs and planks we cut from our forests. And there's an opening at the top to let out smoke. We sleep along the outside edges of the house. That's my mother tucking in my two younger brothers. Our blankets are bear skins, and they are very soft and warm. On one wall in our house is our clan symbol, the frog. So what does all this have to do with bravery? 
You see, clans are very important to our people. They are like big families, and it is forbidden to marry someone from your own clan. I wanted to marry a boy from the Wolf Clan. His name is Danawak, and he's kind and caring. But my parents wanted me to marry Danawak's older brother, Jago. Jago was the oldest eligible boy in another clan, so that's who my parents insisted I marry. This is the way of clans, and parents arrange all marriages, and everyone has to obey clan rules. When you belong to a clan, you get special privileges, like being able to hunt in clan territory. My father is a very good hunter, and he and my brother hunt for deer and elk in our forests. They also set traps and snares. This is a snare. A string is tied to a bent tree. At the other end of the string is a loop. When a small animal runs through the loop, it triggers the snare. This is just a stick, but it could have easily been a rabbit or squirrel. Women do gathering in areas set aside for their clan. We gather fruit and berries and other things that grow in our forest. Wild strawberries are my little sister's favorite. Clans also cut trees in their own areas. Cedar trees are the ones we use to make our houses, poles, and canoes. The men use adzes to start the cut. The blade of the adze my father is using is made of iron, which we get by trading with people far to the north. Iron blades work better than the stone blades we used to use, but tree falling is still hard work. And that's why the men will set a fire in the place cut out for it. The fire will eventually burn its way through the cedar. Next, the men use pounding stones and wedges to split the tree into planks. You can hear the tree splitting. Cedar splits easily when wedged properly. The men may get 50 planks out of a small tree like this one. We use cedar to make lots of things. Sometimes we strip the bark from the cedar. This is done by first making incisions in the bark using a small adze. The bark is then pried away from the cedar. Finally, it is stripped. A good bark stripper, like my father, can strip the bark a long way up. When done properly, stripping does not harm the cedar. The brown outer bark is then stripped away as only the inner bark can be used. Later, the bark strips are soaked in hot water to make them soft and pliable. The strips are laid out and then woven together, one strip going under every other strip. This is the start of a basket. Nina. And this is what the basket looks like when it's nearly complete. The strips are folded back and then tied off with string made from root. My little sister watches every step, for soon she will have to know how to make baskets herself. Bark can also be braided and made into rope, belts, headbands, and even clothing. Several men in our clan are excellent carvers. They carve many things, 
but some of the most important things they carve are masks. The masks represent supernatural beings and animals important to our clan. They're never used for play, but for special ceremonies. This mask is the wolf. I mentioned how clans have special privileges. Another one is the right to fish in certain areas. One way we fish is with spears. The points are first sharpened with a stone. One man will beat the water with a stick, driving a salmon with a spear. Then it's up to the spear to have an accurate aim and not let the salmon off the spear. Using this technique, two men should be able to spear enough salmon in one afternoon to feed the entire village. There are a number of ways to cook salmon. One way is by bracing it with sticks and then roasting it over a fire. Just far enough away to keep the sticks from burning. This gives the salmon a smoky flavor. Another way to cook salmon is by boiling. A hot rock is placed in a box filled with water. This causes the water to boil. Next, my mother adds green plants, like wild onions. And then, sections of salmon, for salmon stew. Salmon stew is not my favorite. Every year, the bones from the first salmon caught must be returned to the water from which they came. We believe that salmon offer themselves to our people so that we may eat them. For this, we must show them great respect. By returning their bones to the water, the salmon will be able to resurrect themselves and return to our people the following year. Our people show respect for everything in the natural world, for we believe everything in nature has a spirit life. As long as we show proper respect, we will lead good and healthy lives and never do without. But there are evil spirits in the world, and when things go wrong like sickness, it is sometimes because of the evil spirits. Shamans, or medicine men, have been specially trained to deal with illness. Many times they use herbs and medicines to cure the sick. But sometimes it is necessary for the shaman to call upon spirit helpers and perform special acts to cleanse and purify the bodies of those who are contaminated. The shaman works very hard, sometimes for days before he is successful. I don't want you to think we never have time for games, because we do. One of my favorite games is foot racing. Another game we play is tug of war. Boys games are a little rougher, like wrestling. And stick fighting teaches boys to become good warriors. There was no question Jago would become a good warrior, and that's who I would have had to have married if Danawak had improved himself. Here's what happened. Our chief had brought his grandson to the forest to show him how cedars were cut. Danawak was the fire tender that day. The chief wanted to give instructions to the men and let the boy alone. Suddenly, the cedar began to fall. Danawak was the first to see it. It's yet win! Danawak dove and pushed the boy away just as the tree hit the ground. The boy was shaken up, but he'd be all right. Needless to say, the chief was very thankful his grandson was saved. So thankful, in fact, he talked to my parents telling them how brave Danawak had been that day. My parents were so impressed, they finally agreed to let me marry Danawak instead of Jago.
Golden Sparrow and Danawak would eventually marry, but their family would be the last to live entirely in the old ways. A new people, the Europeans, had entered the continent. In just a matter of years, the way of life of native peoples would be forever changed. Okay, I, apolo I apologize uh, for the rough uh, transition there, but we're not going to finish the rest of that film because it goes into into the present, which is important to cover, but it does more on European tradition versus Northwest. Uh, to finish this piece on Northwest tradition, we're going to, um, or you, because I'm not with you, uh, are going to complete some readings um, or a story on Northwest culture. Now, a copy of that story, you know, we've tried to read one within every culture that we've done, is found on the website. So I'm in, uh, on the class website right now. So here's nesthistory.org. I'm going to the current unit, there we are. And we're going to look at the stories, the Native American stories that we've been doing at the beginning of each class period. Some of these will look familiar to you. We did uh, Manaboso and the Maple Trees for the Eastern Woodland. But today, the story you're going to be reading is called Luit the Firekeeper. It's a Nisqually story from the Pacific Northwest. When you're finished reading this story, uh, you are to write a paragraph identifying the lessons you learned from the story and what applications do those lessons have in our lives today? And in your blue book, I'm going to have you write that application on the bottom of page 18. The bottom of page 18. And in your yellow book, uh, you will be writing that application on the bottom, oh, in the space where it says additional notes on the Northwest Indians on page 40. So one more time, I'm going to have the teacher pause the recording. She will hand out you a copy of Lewitt, the Firekeeper. And in each of your respective books, the blue and yellow book, you are to write a paragraph identifying the lessons you learned from the story and what applications this story has in your life today. When we come back, we will be finishing Inuit and Southwest culture. Enjoy the story. Hope you enjoyed the story. I'd be interested to hear some of the discussions you have. Maybe I'll contact Mrs. Rawson and find out what, what you guys discussed in what were the lessons uh, from Lou Witt. But we're going to move on and we're going to look at our next cultural group. Now, we've, we've only got about 30 minutes remaining and we're going to be doing the Inuit and the Southwest in that time. So bear with me. We're going to be zipping through here. At this point in your workbooks, if you have the blue book, you should be on page 18. And in the yellow book, you should be on page 40. So let's get our notes in here. We have a film clip we're going to be watching. And a okay, the Inuit. This is the second of three groups we'll be studying today. The Inuit are the Arctic tribes that learn to adapt to one of the harshest environments on Earth. If you look at the map, you'll notice the areas in lavender and in purple. Those are the areas where the Inuit lived. Um, the majority of this area is in modern-day Canada, but of course that northern, northwestern area is Alaska, which is part of the United States, even though it's not the continental United States. So we include the Inuit in our study of native peoples in the United States today. Those people who learned here, lived here learned to adapt to one of the harshest environments on Earth. Much of this uh, region is covered with snow year-round, particularly that light uh, purple area. And the area in purple is typically uh, tundra, so frozen grasslands that you couldn't grow gardens in. So the people who live here have had to adapt to a very, very difficult environment. They couldn't grow crops, the ground is frozen, and their spring and summer are quite short. Traditionally, the Inuit people survived by hunting caribou, muskox, polar bear, seal, walrus, and whales. And in fact, in a moment, we're going to have you watch uh, a whale hunt. I think you'll find that fascinating. They fished for Arctic char, cod, and salmon. If you go back and look at that list I just read, the polar bear, the seal, the walrus, the whale, the arctic char, the cod, and salmon are all animals in the water. They're, they're fish. So these people are living largely along the waterways, so on uh, the, along the Pacific coast, in this area here is where most of them are going to live. And as they're moving inland along rivers and, and bays, because they're surviving on fish. That's their, their primary food they eat. During the short summer season, they gathered berries and they dried them. Um, 
so like raisins, but they, they had huckleberries and uh, blackberries that grow in abundance during that summer season, and they needed those for vitamin C in their diet. Um, and then these groups, I think this is fascinating, had traditional trade routes where long before Columbus came to America, these groups traveled throughout all of this northern portion of North America, from Newfoundland all the way to the far corner of Alaska, and we have uh, lots of evidence that these people traveled not just from the east coast, but across the Bering Sea, and we're moving in, uh, we're traveling and trading throughout what today is northwestern Russia, long before, or excuse me, that mean northeastern Russia, uh, long before Columbus arrived. Now, those people who were traveling across to Russia in these trading routes would be trading goods, um, bringing goods all the way from Canada to Russia before Columbus, but those people they were trading with were not trading with people in Western Europe. So there wasn't that kind of interaction. These Inuit had trade and bartering routes that spanned hundreds, even thousands of miles. The way they would travel, because again, they're on snow and frozen tundra, was the use of the dog sled. So they could load up the dog sled with goods. Uh, the, the husky dog was specifically bred by the Inuit natives. It has a thick, heavy fur and strong uh, lungs, strong legs, so that it could be you know, their horse. A horse wouldn't survive in, in this region, and in either case, in 1491, there were no horses in North America, period. Or the, the husky uh, was their horse. The Siberian husky was their horse, and they would use it to, to move their goods as a nomadic people. Now, they did have permanent homes along the coast, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so let's look at Inuit clothing. Um, the elders, uh, in the past, they, they typically wore caribou or bearskin clothing, and then they had a lining that was made of seal so that it would um, work as a water repellent. So if you look at the boats in the bottom right-hand corner, you see an exterior uh, boot and then an interior boat boot. This is made, the, in the uh, exterior on the right is made of seal skin. Uh, it, it's as waterproof as Gore-Tex, so the water can't get in. And then that seal skin lining is placed inside of the thick um, caribou coated, the warm caribou boots, so that when they're wearing the boots, uh, this, the exterior adds warmth and the interior so that the water can't get through the skin. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see traditional clothing, uh, the, the thick wool, or excuse me, the thick fur from the caribou or bear skin, almost always lined by the seal skin. And if, if they had a day where it was a little uh, warmer, they could pull the outer coat off and then you'd have the seal, seal skin jacket. Uh, the Inuit did not weave fibers. There were no, again, these, these guys live in frozen tundra. There is, there's nothing growing here that they can weave. So they're using natural animal products to dress in. I think that picture up in the right, uh, not only is it dang cute, but it does a good example of showing how these people could live in below zero temperatures and survive. So there's an example of Inuit clothing. So I'm going to show you in just a moment how they did a whale hunt, but let me show you their homes. In Inuit culture, the majority of people lived in houses made of wood and whalebone. They were permanent homes. Now, wood was very difficult to come by. Uh, because of the landscape, but whalebone was not. And so typically what they would do, and this is uh, the exterior of an old home. Again, most of these homes are gone. Today, Inuit live in homes much like you might have today, and there are quite a few Inuit. This is one of our larger native groups that still are around today. Um, but in the past, they lived in homes that were dug into the side of a mountain or in the side of a hill so that they can use the insulation of the earth to keep it warm. And then to support that home with the weight of the snow or the water on the roof, they would use whalebone. So if you look at the picture on the right, or on, on the picture on the right-hand side, you can see those large uh, whalebone entryways. At one point, this entire thing would have been covered uh, with dirt. This is the interior, and those whalebones are, would serve kind of like a two-by-four in your home to support the home. Um, so you have a whalebone interior skeleton on the house. 
The house is then covered or mounded with dirt. And then to hold everything, you know, to keep it from, from water soaking through, you then have um, the skin, uh, the walrus skin, that is sewed together, stitched together, and that's on the sides of the home and the roof of the home. So if you went inside, it would look kind of like it was wallpapered, uh, like tapestries hanging. And in fact, in some of those, those homes, the walrus skins would be painted with patterns and designs that were significant for those, for those people who lived there. So again, this group, nomadic for trading, but they did have permanent homes. So they would trade largely in the spring and summer, and then in the winter they'd move into their homes and live off uh, the fish that they hunted in the winter and the, the berries that they had dried during the summer. So they're living in interior homes. Um, because these homes do not work well with fireplaces, and there's not a there's not a, a sky hole in the home. They would light them with uh, lamps that were made out of like an adobe. It was a clay lamp. In some cases, a stone that was carved into the shape of a lamp, and then it would be filled with seal oil. Seal oil burns really really clean. So you you know you kill the seal, you pull off the fat, you melt it down into an oil and when you burn it it burns much cleaner than kerosene so they'd have kerosene lamps or seal oil lamps around the home inside to provide light day and night some of the more um, famous of those are the Inu Inupiaq and the Yupik so in the picture you see a, a, a home their permanent home but as I indicated before these guys were trading moving across continents and so they had to have nomadic homes for trading and in that case, they would use the, the, the igloo, which was temporarily built. Uh, they wouldn't stay permanently in the igloo. It was just for that time period when they were you know, on the road, so to speak. In, uh, the igloo was made of blocks of snow or ice. Okay, so let's pause here for a minute, and I would like to share with you a video of a whale hunt. hunt. And then when we're done, we'll come back and uh, talk about what, what was of interest to you about the Inuit. Every spring and fall, thousands of whales migrate through Arctic waters. For two millennia, Inupiat whalers have sat patiently in their umiaks, searching the horizon for bowhead. Whaling has been in our family for thousands of years. We are connected with the whale. We are, without one, we can't live without each other. You know, it's it's kind of hard to explain. It's, it's like in our blood. We're headed out to an extreme edge of the polar ice cap. The trip across the ice is treacherous. Massive pressure ridges of ice, constantly shifting and cracking, must be carefully navigated. The search for a safe campsite takes nearly all day. If there's no landlocked ice, we won't be venturing out here, a place where what we call the Nungyak Duwik place where we can safe ice, place we need police to go run. In case there's an emergency, the ice come in, breaks up everything. Place where we can run is always to the landlocked ice. The Inupiat have 100 words for snow and nearly as many for ice. Along with safe camp ice, the whalers need to find ice that can be melted for drinking water. It's good ice, huh? Very Good ice. Oh. Mm. Real good. On the edge of the ice, Percy's crew waits, harpoon and dart guns ready. At first sign of bowhead, the Inupiat will pursue the whale in skin boats made of bearded seal hide and caribou sinew. The whalers have almost given up hope when two bowheads are spotted near the edge of the ice. The hunters launch their boats in pursuit. The whaling captains strike, landing a harpoon in the bowhead's neck. 
my dad, when he first caught his whale, there's an experience he couldn't explain. He claims to have died with the whale. When he harpooned the whale, he said he blacked out. He couldn't remember anything. And when he came to, he woke up and he was tying the flukes of the whales together. He was tying them together so when they're getting ready to tow the whale, he tied them together and that's when he woke up. The Eskimo believe the whale offers its life to them as a gift. Out of respect for the whale's sacrifice, the Eskimo offer a prayer of thanks. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. Amen. It takes everyone there, 65, 70 people, to haul the bowhead onto the ice. Stripped down to their shirt sleeves, the community works steadily through the day. Body heat from the whale is melting the already thin ice, so there can be no stopping. It's a grueling, bloody process, but no one complains. Welcome to the birthday program, everybody. And I got some good news. Congratulations to ABC crew. They just caught the first whale of the whaling season. Many congratulations, ABC crew. The Inupiat will give thanks for the gift they have received. They would celebrate in the Luckatuck. An ancient celebration, Nalakatuk is hosted by the whaling captains and their crews. It was good. The ice was good. But it's whaling time. And the tradition's got to be kept up. Great. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, you will notice that in the video they were fairly um, circumspect, meaning they didn't show uh, the spearing of the whale. They get you right to the point where they're going to harpoon it and then they pull back, as well as the cleaning of the carcass. And that's because in Inuit culture it's still considered sacred. Um, and so out of respect for that culture, I, I didn't show that. Um, if you really don't care about respect and you'd like to look up more, go on to YouTube and you can see them actually spear the well and uh, you'll find videos of them cleaning the carcass. Now with that, um, I'd like to end this piece by having you go into your workbooks. Again, you should have it open in front of you, but on in the blue book, you would be on page 19. And in the yellow book, you are on page 41. And answer the question you see at the bottom of the screen. What is interesting, one interesting fact you learned about the Inuit natives? Why was it interesting to you? And then explain your answer. I'll give you about three minutes if you want to pause the, uh, the video uh, to answer that question, and then we're going to do our last unit, which is the Southwest Natives. Okay, so if you're back on screen, we're going to assume that you have uh, finished your notes on Inuit and we're going to look at the Southwest culture. So the Southwest climate is generally hot and arid. Many of you are familiar with this area because it encompasses southern Utah. Well, St. George, Cedar City, uh, and then as you cross into uh, the Four Corners region, Arizona, New Mexico, southern Colorado, is considered the Southwest region where natives live. 
this area could not be any more opposite of what you've just looked at. This area is, is generally desert. It's dotted with cactus and other water miser plants. There are some few green river valleys that grace this area. Uh, the uh, Rio Grande comes through here, as, as does the Colorado. Uh, during the summer, you have rain that in some areas that make it possible to farm. Due to the large size and, and uh, the variety of geography in this region, the re tribes of this region had many similarities as well as some differences. All of, these, all of the tribes in this region uh, were based on a farming society. Because it was a desert, there were not a lot of there's not a lot of big game. Buffalo doesn't come into the southwest. Uh, deer don't go into the southwest. You might get some antelope. Uh, you get smaller game like rabbit. But that's going to be difficult to feed a family on a rabbit. Um, and it's, it's not, again, the, the animals that are on this continent are not domesticatable. So if you're reliant on only the wild game that comes through, you'll starve to death. So these guys farmed. It was supplemented by the hunting and gathering. Uh, they largely grew corn, bean, and squash. And because they were farmers, they stayed in the same place year-round. These tribes were not nomadic. In fact, if you'll notice, none of these groups, except for the plains, were nomadic. Some of the more popular groups in the southwest include the Anasazi, the Hopi, the Navajo, and the Apache. The peoples who lived here differed in the crops they farmed and grew, although consistently they all farmed corn, bean, and squash. The style of their housing uh, varied throughout the southwest. Many used stone, mud, or adobe. They built grass huts, and if you look in the bottom uh, right, you see a hogan, which is a Navajo home. Uh, the hogan used, uh, used uh, wood for the base or sometimes sod, and then the roof has, uh, is made with dirt with grass on top and occasionally they'd have teepees but those were for hunting uh, so those who traveled throughout the region to sustain themselves so the Apache warriors uh, who in many ways are, are following examples of the Plains culture but most of these homes were permanent homes in fact the home in the upper left hand corner uh, that's in Taos New Mexico it is the city in the United States, the present-day United States, that has been inhabited for the longest period of time. The city of Taos uh, still has people living in it. It is a national heritage site, a world heritage site, UNESCO-protected world heritage site. And the city of Taos, those homes are very similar to the ones you see there. I'll, I'll show a picture here in just a second so you can see uh, just how little Taos has changed. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll be familiar with that picture. That's in Mesa Verde. You probably covered that with Mr. Vincent in Utah history. This is the American Southwest. Permanent homes. This group was the first to come into contact with European explorers, Spanish, who came up from Central America and into Mexico. Uh, they were here in present-day United States as early as 1541. English, of course, won't show up on the West Coast until permanently until 1607. Just as on the east in the uh, East Coast, where the English arrive and Eastern woodland natives teach the English how to survive by growing corn. You might remember the story of Tisquantum or Squanto that we shared. In the Southwest, um, the natives or the Europeans here survived as well by the southwest natives teaching them how to grow corn and beans and squash and here in the southwest uh, they did it in a similar fashion although these groups had to learn how to do irrigation so they would bring in water in irrigation canals uh, to keep their crops alive because the the rain wasn't consistent um, and the, the Spaniards who will follow them will follow their example by growing corn, bean, and squash with irrigation canals that are brought in to support and sustain uh, the growth of corn, bean, and squash. Okay, with each native group that we have discussed, I have shared with you the clothing that, that they wore. And I hope you've noticed how many of these native groups were wearing clothing that was something made than other than leather. leather. The Eastern Woodland wore a, a textile uh, clothing 
uh, made out of a woven hemp fiber. The California used yucca fibers to, to make woven clothing. The Northwest used this, I mean, the cedar wood to, to uh, weave their clothing. In the Southwest, they really had brought this to an art. And um, when Europeans arrived, they were surprised to see the Southwest natives wearing clothing made from an American type of cotton. The cotton was grown and harvested by the Southwest uh, natives. They dyed it, they carded it, cleaned it, spun it. And in fact, the Spaniard that first will come into this region, a man by the name of Cabeza de Vaca, who arrives in, in and around Santa Fe, talks about finding natives wearing clothing made out of linen and, and cotton that was very fine. These southwestern natives were artisans in making beautiful, beautiful uh, cotton clothing. So that was one of the clothing they wore. They also used leather. Gives you a little insight into their clothing. So to end this piece, because time is just hammering down on me, you're going to end with uh, a film clip on the Southwest culture, on the Anasazi, Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Benito, and Cliff Palaces. Now as you watch this in your workbook, there's a question you're going to be answering. It's just to the end of the section you completed. And you need to, to write down three traits and or traditions of the pre-Columbian natives of the Southwest and explain those. So we're going to go ahead and start that right now for you to see that. To the outsider, the sun-beaten deserts of the American Southwest are a harsh and unforgiving land, reluctant to support life. To the ancient people who lived there, it was a place where the Creator provided everything. There is nothing there that you can see, even to this day. Very little vegetation, you see a lot of rocks, you see a lot of sand. The Hopis have always maintained that that's a chosen place for them. It was chosen for them by the Creator, the Great Spirit for the Hopis. The ancient people of the desert were the ancestors of all the modern Pueblo nations. To their Hopi descendants, they are known as the Hisatsunam. But to most of the world, they are known by the Navajo name, Anasazi. Around 900 AD, the Anasazi flourished in a wide circle covering parts of modern-day Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. The Anasazi found balance with their world. They learned where to find water and how to harness it. Villages joined together to build dams, reservoirs, and irrigation canals, turning deserts into gardens of corn and squash. They were a people intimately connected to their land. In a very real sense, they emerged from it. Generations before the time of Christ, the Anasazi lived in subterranean pit houses, sunken homes with stonework walls and broad, strong roofs. Formidable protection against the searing sun and bitter cold of the desert. With time, they adapted their above-ground storage houses into living spaces. But the underground pit houses were not abandoned. They were retained as spiritual places of teaching, the place of origin the Kiva. One hundred years before the first Gothic cathedrals were built in Europe, the master architects and stonemasons of the Anasazi were building great Kivas that could hold 500 people. Around 900 AD, the Anasazi leadership embarked upon a bold and visionary plan. Create a Mecca for pilgrimages, and a focal point for trade at the very center of their land. They chose the barren, treeless Chaco Canyon, 100 miles northwest of present-day Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was a monumental undertaking. They built 400 miles of distinctive graded roads and broad avenues, 
all leading to the canyon. At distant points, signal stations were constructed where fires blazed to communicate across the vastness of the desert and to guide travelers at night. Over 50,000 trees were cut down in the surrounding mountains to build the towns of Chaco Canyon. Along with traders and pilgrims, the roads carried resources to maintain dozens of communities. None compared with the largest single complex the Anasazi ever built. Pueblo Bonito, the wonder of the canyon. At its peak, Pueblo Bonito's 800 rooms may have housed over a thousand residents. Some sections overlooking the main plaza loomed five stories above the canyon floor. The plaza pulsated with life. Women gathered the colored corn blanketing the rooftops and knelt in rows to grind it. Children played. Men returning from the fields gathered to talk. Thirty-seven sacred kivas scattered throughout the complex speak to Pueblo Bonito's rich ceremonial life. During ceremonies, the feet of dancers pounded the ground smooth as spectators huddled against buildings and thronged the roofs to watch. But Chaco Canyon was more than a spiritual mecca. It was also a center of trade and commerce. And trade in one stone, more valuable to Chaco's Mexican trading partners than gold or jade, was the engine of the canyon's economic growth. Turquoise. Here, raw stone arrived from distant mines for the craftsmen of Pueblo Bonito to cut and shape into small tiles and beads, which were then traded south to merchant centers in the heart of Mexico. There they were transformed into extraordinary creations. For 150 years, trade fueled the Chaco economy, but the wealth and power of the canyon was fleeting. Chaco's major turquoise consumer, Tolan, in central Mexico, fell to civil strife. Extended drought or hostilities also may have contributed to the downfall of Chaco Canyon. By 1150, it was in decline. The great turquoise road over the Mexican High Sierra abandoned. But the Anasazi world still flourished. The people of Chaco Canyon simply moved to other locations. Many went north to Mesa Verde, which at that time was reaching its cultural and architectural height. There, under the shelter of the pine-studded mesas of southern Colorado, the architects of Chaco Canyon would help create some of the most stunning buildings of all time. The largest of these is known as Cliff Palace, though it is a palace in name only. These beautiful stone buildings of the Anasazi were home to common families. It was a society based on equality. Men rotated service on public works. Women plastered houses. The man who farmed also carved. Spiritual leaders tilled the fields. Each time when I see and visit any ancient dwelling, I feel close because these are my ancestors, my forefathers for centuries. With little meditation, looking at their dwellings, within a few minutes, half hour, I get refreshed. The people of Mesa Verde and many other Anasazi towns relocated around 1300. The period of the ancestors came to an end and the modern day Pueblo world took shape.
Traditions that live today in the American Southwest, the way of life, the architecture, the religion, are the resonance of a heritage reaching back thousands of years. Okay, so that wraps it up. Uh, at this point, we have covered the major native cultural groups that we will be covering prior to our exam. Uh, I, I am aware that one of uh, our classes has not finished the California. I'll finish that with you before the exam on, on Monday. And as you wrap up this piece, I'd like you to end your discussion on the Southwest by answering the question, what is one interesting fact you learned about the Southwest natives? Why? What did you find interesting? Why? And then explain your answer. Okay, we're going to be grading all of this work, the notes you did, the material you covered uh, in class when I return on Monday and Wednesday, and we'll be taking our final exam then. So wrap things up. Don't lose your material. You will need it uh, for us to review. And I'll look forward to seeing you on Monday. Bye now.